Now, here's, here's something for everybody in the message this morning. Something for everybody. Uh, somebody was telling me they were going down through Kentucky years ago, and they saw a large sign at a horse riding stable. And here's what it said. You may rent a horse to ride here. That's what it said. You can rent the horse by the hour, or you can rent a horse by the three hours, or you can rent a horse by the day. And they said, we have a horse for everybody. We have old horses for older people. We have younger horses for younger people. We have tall horses for tall people. We have shorter horses for shorter people. We have fast horses for exciting people and slow horses for those that are not near as excited. And for those that have never ridden horses before, we have horses that have never been ridden before. I mean, we just got a horse for everybody. And there's something here for everyone. Take your Bibles, Luke chapter number 16, and let me get right into the message. Put this watch out here so I'll know exactly what to do. Luke 16. And I want you to read this with me as though you have never read it before in your life. And some of you maybe haven't. But I want you to read this with me. Follow with me as I read. Now, you don't read it out loud with me, but follow along with me as I read. And I'm starting in Luke 16 and verse number 19. Everybody stand up. Stand up for Jesus, ye soldiers of the cross. Lift high his royal banner. It must not suffer loss. Luke 16, verse number 19. And there was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his gate full of sores. And desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table, moreover the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Now stop right there and let me point out something. I don't, just a passing thought, but I, I dare not let it drop. Here was a man that had everything. Here was a man that had nothing. They both died. One, the, the man that had everything went to hell. The man that had nothing went to heaven. What's the bottom line? At the, at the worst is still the best to be a Christian. At the worst you ever had in your life, you're still better off to be saved than the most glorious, rich, and prosperous person you ever knew, known in your life that doesn't have the Lord. Now let's continue reading here. And in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his swinger in water and cool my tongue. Now I want you to notice, here's a man in hell looking across into heaven. I don't have any evidence to believe that people in heaven can see down into hell, but I do have Bible evidence clear here to believe that people when they get to hell will be able to look across into heaven and it seems so close and yet it is so far away. I don't know how many of you ever toured Alcatraz, The Rock, in the San Francisco Bay. I've been through it a couple of times. And um, the one thing that struck me is what the prisoner said was the worst thing about the place. It wasn't the food. As a matter of fact, they said the food was pretty good. And it wasn't the hole that some of them ended up in, the solitary confinement, little narrow cell, dark. One man w was in the hole. He said, and we heard this while we were there. He said, uh, a recording, of, he said, I, I'd pull a button off my shirt and I'd drop it on the floor. And I'd get down on the floor and crawl around and see if I could find the button. And I did that for my sanity. I had to have something to do or I'd have gone stone crazy in the hole. But yet that was not the worst part of it. They said the worst part of Alcatraz was this. On quiet Friday and Saturday nights, you could barely see men and their wives walking along the shoreline. You could see the little children scampering along with them. You could hear the sounds of the city when the wind got just right. You could, you could really hear, smell the smells from the fisherman's wharf. And you could hear the music and everything that we ever wanted was so close and yet so far away. Everything that we ever wanted, we could see. But we would live and die and never have it. 
And they said that was the worst thing. And that's exactly what this rich man's doing. He's looking across from hell into heaven. And he cries for a drop of water to go on his tongue, according to this verse 24. And he said, I'm tormented in this flame. He, he, he looked across. He had eyes. He had a tongue. Uh, he wanted real water and a real person to come and dip the tip of their finger in water and put it on his tongue. Hell is a real place where real people fall and burn and scream forever and ever and ever and ever. And the Lord warned us about this place. Do you believe in hell? If you don't, you don't believe the Bible. Over 200 times in the New Testament alone, the Lord Jesus Christ and the other writers made reference to hell. Over and over in the Bible, it's called, says in Psalms 9, 17, the wicked shall be turned into hell. Matthew 5, 26, danger of hell fire. Mark 9, 46, everlasting fire. Jude 7, the vengeance of eternal fire. We're talking about a real place where real people go and burn forever and ever and ever. Do you believe what the Bible says? Do you believe what Jesus taught? Jesus wrote what I just read to you here. And he was the one doing the speaking and so, do you really believe there's a hell? If you do, I've got some questions to ask you. First, let's bow our heads in prayer. Holy Spirit of God, I pray that you'll bless us now as we preach the Bible. Lord, we're not looking for the truth. We found it. We're not looking for something near the Word of God. We have it. We hold in our hands the very inerrant, inspired, preserved, jot and tittle, perfect, verbal, plenary Word of God, living, uh, that liveth and uh, forever. And I pray, Lord Jesus, you'll bless us now as we preach this Bible. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated, please. You may be seated, please. We have a daughter in Tula, Mexico, uh, and uh, she and her husband, Matt Johnson, have been there for 28 years. And they have two great works there. They uh, built a great church, and they built another great church. And we've been there and preached for them many times. And, and uh, Matt and Annetta Johnson, uh, not many months ago, there was an explosion near their house. A horrible thing happened. A gas line had erupted, and it was throwing gas into the air. And people began to rush in to get some of that gas. Literally, they were stealing. There were 18 military men there tried to stop them, but they kept coming. There were hundreds of them. And I think if our sound man has it, he's going to show it to you on the screen uh, this morning, a little bit about it. What you're about to see was never aired in the United States of America, to my knowledge. We'd be letting them talk to you, but it's in Spanish. Some of you would know, and others would. You see the gas line erupted on the left-hand side of the picture. You see people with their gas buckets. This happened just a few months ago. There were their gas buckets running. Uh, most of them have two gallons of gas, three gallons of gas, in a five-gallon container. Now, I want you to notice the gas soaking those people. The gas is soaking the people. People were yelling, this thing's going to blow. You know it's going to blow. They said that a cell phone could have ignited it as much gas. This is not diesel fuel, folks. This is gas, high-octane gas. And it's being blown into the air and soaking hundreds of people with the gas. Now, keep your eyes on this, and you're about to see something else. As the time went on and as it began to get dark, they kept rushing in to get this gas. And... Um, I want you to look now, just, uh, this all was uh, caught on a cell phone. Look just to the right of where this man's walking, out to the top of the hill, on the right. There it is. That's when it blew right there. Blew right there. You hear the people screaming. Over 300 people died right there. Look, look, if you, if you know, see the little fires running out from the fire. Those are bodies on fire. All that you see there are bodies on fire. Uh, most of them died right in location, but many of them were, were, had enough life that they began to run. I could not show everything. As you continue to see it, and I cut it off, you, you won't see it now. As, they, as I, you continue to watch, men ran up with their clothes burned off and their flesh sagging on their bodies. The terror, the horror of that. I thought to myself, I've never seen a clearer picture of hell. Look at them fall to see where the fires have stopped. That's as far as they got. And they dropped dead right there. Look at the people walking along. Some of them, their heads and shoulders on fire. In shock. Total shock. 
You can shut it off right there. 18 military men tried to stop those people from getting that gas and tried to tell them, it's too dangerous, the thing's going to blow. And they said, people getting the gas were even saying to each other, you know this thing's going to blow. But there was comfort in numbers. If one person had to run out there to do that, the other... 300 would have said, stop, don't do that, it's too dangerous. But because everybody was doing it, it gave a certain security, it gave a certain comfort. There is comfort in numbers. The Bible says, broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many there be that go in there at. Narrow is the way that leads to life everlasting, and few there be it. I've heard people joke and say, if I go to hell, I'll have a whole lot of company. Yes, you will. You certainly will. But it won't reduce the temperature of hell one degree. And folks, hell is a million times worse than what you just saw projected on that screen. These people, most of them died within a matter of seconds. Some of them died almost within five seconds. They were right near the ditch and they died within five seconds. Many of these people, uh, and, and the ones that were the worst off were those that made it to the hospital and died because they had the longest time to suffer. Over 300, the, the numbers kept escalating. At first they thought it was 200 and more and more people kept dying and then it was up to uh, 300. Um, our daughter Annetta said, Dad, if you could have heard the screams, if you could have heard what they were screaming, oh, the price they paid for three gallons of gas. The price they paid. And they were yelling one to the other, the thing's going to go. And yet they kept on. Do you believe there is a place where human bodies burn and never burn up? Do you believe there's a place where people fall and burn and scream forever and cry for that drop of water? If you could take the top off of hell this morning and look down in there, you'd see that rich man and he'd be still screaming for a drop of water to go on his tongue. And a trillion years from right now, he will, he will still be there. And I'd be as crooked as a dog's hind leg if I didn't come here and warn you about it this morning. Do you believe there's a hell? If if I believe there's a hell, what kind of a preacher would I be? And I, it convicts me every time I think about that. If I believe there's a hell, what kind of a preacher would I be? Jesus here is speaking these words. And in Mark 9, 43, for instance, one of the many places he spoke of hell. And if thy hand offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter into life maimed than having two hands to go into hell into the fire that never shall be quenched. Where their worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. And if thy foot offend thee, uh, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter into life uh, halt than having two feet to be cast into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched. Notice, never shall be reduced in heat, never shall be put out, never shall stop burning. And notice here it says, where their worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. It says that three times in this passage. Uh, Jameson, Fawcett, and Brown in their great commentary said the word worm is the Greek word skolex, which means a worm that t uh, preys on dead and decaying flesh. It's literal worms. You go to the book of Isaiah and the Bible says the worms cover thee and the worms are under thee in hell. Folks, hell transcends the, the wild, no feverish mind running 107 fever in the middle of the night. No feverish mind in the horrors of the imagination ever began to capture the torment waits people in hell. What kind of a preacher would I be? Jonathan Edwards believed in hell, preached that great sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, and used as his text, Their foot shall slide in due time. And he pictured people sliding over the edge of hell uh, any moment of their life, dropping off into hell. And he pr believed in hell so real and preached in, with hell with such vision and compassion and power that people literally, while he was preaching, would hold on to the poles of the great tabernacle and say, My God, Mr. Edwards, stop, stop before we go to hell, before you get done preaching. Stop! 
What kind of a preacher would I be? John the Baptist in Matthew 3, 7 and Luke 37 says, Flee the wrath to come. Run from it. You're here this morning. Number one, you're here without Jesus Christ this morning. Whatever you do, don't you walk out those doors without Jesus Christ. You are one heartbeat from hell. You're one heartbeat from what you're looking at except a million times worse. What kind of a preacher would I be? The great preacher Percy Ray, uh, Count Zion, Myrtle, Mississippi. I never got to go there, but I heard a lot about the place. And Percy Ray was a great and godly man of God. He had a sermon called The Red Light of Hell. And he would take a lantern, or take a light, and he would take the light, and he would uh, get this one turned on. And during that sermon, warning people about hell, they said that he would run all over the auditorium and swing in that lantern saying, Stop! Stop! Don't go to hell! Stop! Stop! What kind of a preacher would I be? What kind of a preacher would I be if I really believed in hell? I had a preacher friend. I heard him tell this story. It blew me away. He said, I was preaching a meeting. And he said, I was going back home. Had to go into New Orleans. And he said, I crossed over the big river bridge there. And it was late. And it was raining. And it was a nasty night to be driving. He said, it was a mist. And, and, and just you, your windshields are scumming up. And he said, as I was crossing the bridge, that long bridge, he said... I, I thought I was hallucinating, but I saw something on the bridge. And he said, I kept looking, and it looked like a man. And he was jumping from side to side, and he had his arms up like this. And he said, then I realized he was real. And then I realized, there's a man out here on this bridge. And he said, the first thing hit my mind is that mental institution on the other side of the bridge. He thought, oh, no, one of those guys have got away. And he's standing up here on a bridge, and here I've got to deal with. Well, now, my preacher friend was a big fellow, six foot three, engine weight over 200 pounds. He was a hunk of a man, and he wasn't real old either. But, and he could handle about anything, but it scared him to death. And he said, I, I got close, so I decided I'd shoot around him, and then could get to the other side of the bridge. I'd call authorities and get somebody to come up and get him off the bridge. And he said, every time I, I'd cut my car to the right, he'd jump over in front of me. Then I'd cut my car to the left, he'd jump over in front of me. And he said, I saw I couldn't get around him. Finally, I slammed on brakes, jumped out and grabbed him and said, Fella, what's wrong with you? He looked up and he said, Mister, the bridge is out right out there, 100 feet, and a Greyhound bus just went over in there. And I've climbed up here to try to stop traffic. And it was true. It was true. So he said, the rest of the night, there was two of us on the bridge. Stop! 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 What kind of a preacher would I be? You better thank God you have attended a church this morning where a man of God believes everything I'm preaching and, and warns people and helps people to know how to be saved and don't want people to go to hell. You better thank God that you're in that kind of a church this morning. What kind of a preacher would I be? Another thing, what kind of a church would you have? All I've heard since I've been here uh, it comes back to this one theme, soul winning. Soul winning, reaching people and building them for the Lord Jesus Christ. I was in your pastor's new converts class this morning. I am converted. I have been saved. My wife has been saved, but I wanted to see what he did. And I was going to tell him later, but I'll tell him now that what he did this morning in that class should be filmed. And if I had a copy of what he did this morning, I'd make it free available to every pastor everywhere I went. We have a pastor here that loves people. He's reaching people. He wants to win people to God and he wants to build them in the thing. What kind of a church would you be if you really believed in, that, in this thing called hell that Jesus warned us about? Uh, what, uh, uh, what kind of a missions program would you have? You know, uh, your pastor spoke in our missions conference a couple of years ago, and I knew he was a good man, a great preacher. I had no idea. He's one of the greatest mission speakers in the country. He has an unbelievable burden for missions. What kind, what, how much would you give to Faith Promise if you really believed all those people where you have missionaries and other places who most of them don't have the opportunity you have to come to a church like this? How much would you give in Faith Promise? What kind of a church would you have? Number three, what kind of a Christian would you be? What kind of a Christian? If you really believed in hell, what kind of a Christian? Matthew 5, 16, so light, let your light sh so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. What kind of a, what kind of a Christian would you be? Yeah. Uh, 
I heard an interesting true story years ago. They, before the days of electronic and automatic uh, train crossing warnings, even the lights and the bells for no electricity, they said they required to have a crossman at the crossing with a lantern. And he was to swing the lantern and stop traffic lest somebody should be killed in the night crossing the train track. One night, a family crossed the track a train hit the family, and most, if not all of them, were killed instantly. The family sued the railroad. And here's what they said. You didn't have a crossman at the crossing. In court, they proved the crossman was there. Then they said, well, if he was there, he didn't have a lantern. They proved in court with the evidence he did have a lantern. Then they said, if the crossman had a lantern, the lantern was not lit. And then they proved in court that the lantern was lit. But here was a problem. The crossman was there. He did have a lantern. He was swinging the lantern, and the lantern was lit. But he had let the globe get so smutty and black, you couldn't see the flame. And the family sued the railroad and collected an enormous amount of money, especially for that day, because they said, you are responsible not only to have the light, you're responsible to not only have a man there, you're responsible to have a light somebody can see. What good is a crossman and a lantern and a light if you can't see the light? Friend, if you're born again, if you know the Lord Jesus Christ is your Savior, you have the light. If any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. You have the Holy Spirit of God living inside of you. If you're saved, I don't care how you're living. I, I, I don't care how immature and premature you are as a Christian. You have the light. The blessed Son of God lives inside of you through the power. But friend, somebody needs to see the light. If your light, life is so smutty, if your life is, is so messed up, either with external misconduct or inward spirit and ugly attitude or whatever it is, if the light is hid so people can see it, what in the world does, good does it do? What kind of a, uh, you know, oh, I'm, so many illustrate. My pastor, Bobby Robertson, went to... Staley Steakhouse, uh, there in Winston-Salem. Staley Steakhouse, a wonderful, wonderful uh, restaurant. And he sat down to eat. And the little teenage girl, I think she was a, either a junior or a senior in high school, she had brought his food. And just as she got to him, she must have stumbled, and she slammed the plate down. And the peas and gravy went all over Brother Bobby. Gravy, oh, and he, he was dressed just like I'm dressed, suit. They were on their way to a meeting. The girl was horrified. He jumped up and grabbed his, his, his uh, napkin and began to clean it off. And she, oh, she was about to faint. She was getting pale and faint. He said, honey, listen, stop, stop, stop. This will clean off. If this is the worst thing that happens to you today, you're going to have a good day. I'll clean it off. Nobody will ever know it happened. I'll make a deal with you. If you don't tell, I won't tell. In a little bit, the manager, Mr. Staley himself, came out and said, Brother Robertson, there's something you need to know. We hired that girl. She's a good girl, but she's a lost girl. She don't know the Lord is her Savior. All of us have witnessed to her. All of us have talked to her. She turns a deaf ear, but said, well, you did what you did a while ago when you spoke to that young lady like you did. He said, she came back here and stood and announced to everybody, well, I finally met a Christian. Amen? Everywhere you go, somebody ought to say, well, I finally met a Christian. You ought, a Christian ought to act like a Christian. A Christian ought to talk like a Christian. A Christian ought to have the attitude of a Christian. A Christian ought to have the spirit of a Christian. Good night. A, a, a Christian ought to have a light that shines that people can see and know about. What kind of a Christian would you be? What kind of a Christian would you be? Um, I could go on. What kind of a witness would you be? What kind of a witness would you be? If you really believe in hell. And, and I never preach on these points that I don't get convicted myself. Yeah. Curtis Hudson came with us every year for a revival down through those good years. I don't say every year, but many years, along with Dr. Howells and other great men of God. 
And Curtis Hudson kept asking me, have you ever had Carl Hatch? I said, no, I've heard about him, but I've never had him. Never met him. Never heard him preach. He said, well, you need to have him. I said, why? He said, just have him. Trust me, take my word and have him. Have him in to preach to you people. I said, well, um, you know, I, okay. So I said, what's he like? He said, he's like every Christian should be. He's the most normal Christian you ever met in your life, and he's the only one I really know. That's what he said. Well, I wanted to meet a normal Christian. So I invited him. And I stand at the end of the jetway when he came, and I recognized him from his picture. I said, Brother Hatch. He said, Brother Brown. He was kind of a rough talking fellow. Brother Brown. I said, yes, sir. He said, uh, you parked out in the parking lot? I said, yeah. He said, well, you go get your car, and, and I, I can get my luggage myself. He said, if you pull it around, we, it'll save us some time. I said, well, if that's what you want to do. It took me quite a while. I had to walk all the way out, get the car checked out, and you can't come back to the terminal, you know, inside the terminal complex. You have to go all the way around on the state highway and back around. Around. By the time I got back, he rolled out from under that airport, one of those red caps under his right arm, the fellow that helps you with luggage. He said, tell Brother Brown what just happened here. He said, I just got saved. Did you know, I flew out of that airport many times after that, and I witnessed to that guy several times, because I was curious to know, did he really get saved? And he was saved. He said, Brother Hatch showed me how to get saved. Brother Hatch, Wait, listen, we went to the hospital. I said, do you mind if we run by the hospital? He said, it'll be fine. We, we stopped at the hospital. And as... I said, I got one visit to make, and it'll save me a half a day driving all the way back to Iowa City tomorrow. He said, hey, I'll go with you. So as we walked in the hospital, it was a large solarium, people sitting here in yonder, and there was a middle-aged couple. He just he walked right in. He just walked right up to them and said, how are you folks today? They said, pretty good. He said, you have people here in the hospital. Yeah, my father's back here. He's in intensive care. He's got double pneumonia. They don't think he'll live. He said, you love your daddy, don't you? The guy said, well, yeah, yeah, I really do. He said, you'd like to see him live and not die, wouldn't you? He said, well, I sure would. He said, I'm Brother Hatch. I just go around praying for people. Would you like for me to pray for your father? Oh, that be, you could just see it broke out on him, the appreciation. Oh, it'd be wonderful. Carl Hatch dropped down on his knees. And I never heard a man pray with more compassion for a rank stranger. God, here's a man, his daddy's dying, he loves his daddy, he don't want his daddy to go to hell. And you could just feel, I mean, you could get the vibes. And, and, and when he got done, uh, he said, let me ask you a question. Do you know for sure if you died right now, you'd go to heaven? Well, we're members of the, yeah, I think we're, we're okay. We're, we're members of the uh, Methodist church up here in Tiffin. He said, I'm a member of a Baptist church, but that's not going to get me to heaven. And he stood right there and won that couple to the Lord, as easy as you ever saw. Listen, I don't have the time. He, he'd be standing in the cafeteria line, you know, a long line. And if you were with him, Pastor, he would say, um, uh, Folks, we're glad to have Pastor Wilkerson with us today. Brother Wilkerson trusted the Lord as his Savior. Brother Wilkerson, tell us how it happened. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't have time to tell. I don't have time to get into it. I thought to myself, what kind of a witness would I be? I was preaching for a pastor not, uh, just a few weeks ago, and I laid down. He had a little area upstairs where I could lay down in his home there. And it was Sunday afternoon. I'd preached hard on Sunday morning, was to preach that night. So I laid down to rest a little bit. But as I came in, I remember seeing nine teenage boys shooting basketball on the back of that church property. And he told me when he pulled up, said, they're community boys. We just let them come here and play basketball as long as they behave. It's a good PR thing. And he said, why not? And I laid down and I thought, Lord, there's nine boys out there. If they're not saved, they need to get saved. And I was tired, but I got up and got my trousers on. And I went out there and I said, boys, I don't want to interrupt your game, but there's something you need to know. And I just stood right there and quietly and gently told them how to be saved. And five of the nine bowed their head and trusted Jesus. And I think to myself, why don't I do it all the time? Why am I not a normal Christian? Who, who would I be and what would I be if I really believed there was a literal burning hell? What kind of a witness would I be? What kind of a witness would I be? There's coming a day when it's not going to matter what you did because it's going to be over. Show us a picture. If you have that second picture uh, up there, uh, you're looking at a picture of this same explosion we saw a while ago. And they had no way to know until they studied the DNA or whatever. That body on the left is a 37-year-old mother. That body on the right is her 16-year-old son. You notice a white bone sticking out from her left side there? 
That is her left arm. You notice her head is up. She died with her, she burned to death with her head up. And she's got her head up reaching out to her 16-year-old son to try to do something to help him. But there's no gospel tracts needed there. There's no preachers needed there. Nobody don't, no one needs to get burdened about working a bus route there. Nobody needs to open a King James Bible there. Nobody needs to preach there. There's coming a day when it won't matter what you did. It'll be over with. What kind of a witness would you be? And I close by saying this. What kind, if you really believe there was a literal burning hell, what kind of a sinner would you be? You know, the Bible says in Matthew 23, 33, how shall we escape the damnation of hell? Would you be an unconcerned sinner when the Bible says it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God, Hebrews 10, 31? Would you stand at the great white throne judgment of Revelation 20, verse 11, and the books were opened and another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged out of those things written in the book according to their works? What kind of a sinner would you be? Unconcerned? If that thing blew and you had been there and had fire on your body, would you say, you know, i got to tend to this business of religion someday. You know, we'll try to get around to this. Maybe we can come back next Sunday. Maybe I'll wait till somebody comes to my house. Friend, there's nobody but nobody that was in that scene waiting for anything. Most all of them were doomed. What kind of a sinner would you be? How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? How are you going to escape? You say, I've got to do something. I, I, I'll join the church. You can join the Catholic Church, the Methodist Church, the Baptist Church, the Presbyterian Church, the Pentecostal Church. You can be baptized, capsized, galvanized, and homogenized, but that will not take you to heaven. You must be born again. The church rolls are full of people across America that are going to hell that will say before the Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not in thy name cast out devils and do many wonderful works? And they're telling the truth. They did. They were good people by men's standards. But they died without receiving Jesus Christ as their Savior. Yeah. What kind of a sinner would you be? I'll tell you this story. True story. I could call the preacher's name, and I heard him tell it. He said, before I was saved and a preacher, I was a truck driver. And then I got saved. And he said, when I got saved, I continued to drive the truck. And I tried to witness to people when I could. And he said, I stopped at a truck stop one day, and there was a bunch of infidels in there, and they were cursing and carrying on. And, and, and the reason they were doing it is because I was there. They were making fun of me. And uh, I'd look over now and then and laugh. And he said, I ate my food, and I asked the blessing, and ate my food. And he said, I paid for my meal, and I thought, let them rattle. And he said, I got in my rig, and I pulled off. And when I did, he said, several other trucks had pulled out about the same time from this large truck stop. He said, it was a two-lane, 55-mile and two-lane highway. And he said, I hadn't gone but about a mile. And I looked in my rearview mirror, and he said, a semi was passing several trucks plus mine in a 55 zone on a two-lane highway. And he said, I thought, what in the world? That guy's a total idiot. And said, as he shot by me, it was that head infidel that had been cursing and laughing and said he was laughing and throwing his arm up and kicking his leg up on the seat. But what he didn't know was when he pulled his rig back in the lane, he had run in on a curve too fast. And the centrifugal force of that semi toppled it over an embankment, and it went lumbering down through where they had cut some stumps and, and wood, and it quite a ways, and hit the bottom of that ravine. And he said, we saw it. Several of us saw it. He said, the bed went up just like a straight pencil and fell over on the cab. Well, we knew it had to kill him instantly. 
But we jumped out of our rigs, and when we got down there, to our shock and amazement, he was not dead because the, the cab had caught the bank on the other side, but it had crushed him between that massive seat and the side of the semi. And his left arm and leg was crushed, and he was in excruciating pain. And he, he was yelling, get me out, get me out, and said we began to work to get him out. But, but that cab was so crane, and that's heavy metal, and he said we were futilely trying to get him out. All of a sudden, somebody said, I smell something. And he said, boom, that thing exploded in the fire. And he said that man began to scream. Kill me! Kill me! Take a tire tool and kill me! Do anything! And he said, I saw men singe their hair. I saw men burn their fingers jerking and beating the glass out with tire tools and doing what they could. But the fire, it soon got so hot, there was nothing we could do, and we just stood back and watched that man. He said, that one arm, like this, like a wild worm in the fire, and it stopped. As the fire roared, and he said, we gazed until that arm just fell off in the fire. And he said, a trucker standing near me said, well, one thing about it, it's over for him now. And he said, I said, no, no, a thousand times no, it's not over for him now, it's just begun. What kind of a sinner would you be knowing Jesus Christ died to keep you out of places like that? And you sit here this morning, so I can't join that church. We're not talking about joining the church. We're talking about getting saved. Nobody's going to force you to join this church. Nobody's going to force you to do anything. And you don't have to make a speech. And you don't have to get embarrassed. We make it, easy. We make it as easy as the Bible made it. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed on the name of the only begotten Son of God. What kind of a Christian would you be if you really believed there was a hell? What kind of sinner would you be what kind of a witness would you be? What kind of a life would you have? Can people see the light? You'll meet them tomorrow on the job. You'll see them tomorrow in school. What kind of a witness? What kind of a testimony? What kind of a life would you live if you really believed what our Lord Jesus and the other prophets told us in this book about a real, literal, burning place called hell.